Look, the new neighbors are moving in. Oh, hey, uh, we should go say hi and help and offer to help. And invite them to church. You know what, Chloe? That's a great idea. We'll go right after dinner. Mom, we didn't get to say hi to the new neighbors yesterday. Oh, babe, it was real late last night. We'll plan for the weekend. Look, they're home. We can go meet them. Baby, they're busy bringing in the groceries right now. We can help them. You know what? It's not a good time. They do neighbor ladies nice. Wait, wait. You met them by yourself? No, she just waved at me earlier. What did you say? What'd you do? I waved at her back. Ugh. We can go. They're right outside. No, 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 not like this. I mean, I, I gotta make them something. I gotta buy a gift. That's it. No more excuses. Tomorrow we're going over there and introduce. They're moving. We can say bye. No. No, 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 no. no. We should let them. And I like it because it really kind of speaks to where many of us are at. It's June, believe it or not, it is June. And we are launching into a new series called Reach. And like all our Wednesday night series, it's going to have teaching. We've got other teachers like Pastor Kenneth and Pastor John, and Pastor Harrison, Pastor Bayless are going to be up here on Wednesday nights. And we'll have worship like we've always had it. But we've got one or two extra things for you. We have a challenge to add to the teaching series. And I know what you're thinking, Joel, the last thing I need is one more challenge in my life. I got enough challenges going on. But what if there was a challenge that was presented to you that maybe stretched you a bit, but put you in a position where you would discover something new and fresh from Jesus in your life? Anybody need something new and fresh from Jesus in your life? All right, I'm going to clue you in on a secret. We get that in here, but some of the new and freshness that Jesus wants to give us, we only get out there and how we live out there. So we're going to do this series over the Wednesday nights just in uh, June and July called Reach. And it's a simple way in which God guides us and leads us to engage with our neighbors so that we can live out our faith and witness his love in our life. You should have received one of these when you came in. If you didn't, don't worry about it. We'll get you one in a few minutes. But if you look on the back of it, there is this verse out of Romans 15 too. Each of us should reach his neighbor for his good to build him up. We created Reach as a series because we've discovered a couple of things about most Christians, including ourselves. One is there's kind of this mysterious element to we know we should do it, we want to do it, but how do you really do that? How do you bridge that gap between where we live in our faith and our neighbors who increasingly are living farther and farther away from that? And many times we feel really ill-equipped I don't think I have what it takes to be able to share my faith, what's most important to me, with people around me. I don't know what that would look like. I'm afraid I would kind of get tongue-tied. And if we're really honest, at times we feel like we would fail, like we're better off just staying quiet than misrepresenting God in a way that may be kind of bad press for him. So we really worked at, let's create a very simple process grounded in the word that will help us as a challenge and yet not as something that is based on fear or compulsion or religious obligations. Imagine, genuinely imagine, just a few weeks from now, being able to have a natural, normal, easy conversation with a coworker or a neighbor, or maybe even a family member, where it just flows in terms of the engagement, and you find yourself talking about Jesus and who he is in your life in a very natural and normal way, and you find them being receptive to it and not looking at you like you're a Martian. We really believe 
This can happen for every one of us in here as we follow through the process of reach and what reach is. Because it's not so much inspiration that we need, it's direction that we need. A few weeks ago, I was lifting some heavy stuff and I tweaked my back and I knew I needed to do some exercises to help my back get back to normal. I just didn't know which exercises to do. I didn't need to be inspired to do the exercises. I just needed somebody to say, Joel, here's the three exercises that will help your back the most. That's really what reach is. It's a biblically based teaching with a challenge for you during the week of something to do step by step that will help you with great ease and faith begin to engage with your neighbor and through it, God's going to show you something about himself. If you remember early last year, we did a series on the weekends called Generation to Generation. And many of us were in multi-generational small groups with Bayless's book because that's a core value of Cottonwood. Well, one of the core values of Cottonwood under grace are reaching the lost. It's really important to God, so it should be really important to us. And as we live this out, we live out the value that matters to him, and he shows himself to us. Now, reach is really built on two statements that we're going to study tonight. One statement is made by Jesus, and one statement is made by Paul. So if you have your Bibles, open it up to Matthew chapter 9, and we're going to look at the kind of the two foundational biblical teachings that are the platform upon which we're going to embark on this series and on this challenge for us. Matthew 9 is a story. Matthew was a disciple of Jesus, and it's as if Matthew is sitting here at Cottonwood on a Wednesday night. And he's going, I want to do this. I want to tell my tax collector friends about Jesus. But I'm not wired like Peter or James or John. I don't have that kind of oratory skill. I'm not in the inner circle of Jesus. What do I do? And he comes up with his own reach idea. He throws a party. He gets this idea, I'm going to open up my home, I'm going to throw a party, I'm going to invite all my tax collector friends together, and then I'm going to invite Jesus and my other disciples, the other disciples to be there, so when they're having barbecue and drinking and standing around, every, the disciples and Jesus will intermingle with them. Matthew is doing reach, reaching out to his neighbor, and he does this, and the Bible teaches us that it's a huge success. It's a raging success, and Matthew is stoked, and Jesus is stoked, and the tax collectors are meeting this guy named Jesus, and they're pretty amazed at this stuff, and it seems like everything's fantastic until there's a knock on the door. And there's a knock on the door. Matthew and Jesus go to open the door, and it's not another tax collector from the neighborhood. It's the religious leaders. They look at Jesus, and they look at Matthew, and they look at the disciples, and they say, what are you doing? Why are you hanging out with sinners? Don't you know that God measures your spirituality by what you do inside of the church? What you do in obedience to the law? Not what you do out there. And Jesus finds this golden moment. He's talking to the Pharisees, but he's really talking to the disciples. Because it's a teachable moment for him to teach the disciples and to teach us. Here's what really matters when it comes to reaching your neighbor. Here's what's important to God. Here's what's important to Jesus. Here's what should be important to us. So much of reach and this campaign we're going to embark on is based upon what Jesus says. Verse 12. On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Take a look at these verses, because I want you to notice four phrases of what he says in this. He says this. He says, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. He's looking at his disciples and he says, listen, you've got to have the right heart. This is not about proselytizing. It's not about bringing people into a religion. It's about recognizing where people are at and having a compassion for them because they're the sick, not the righteous. And he says, listen, it begins here. That's why the first stage we're going to discover of reach is just ready your life. Letting God do in your heart what he wants to do so that you will see your neighbors with the same level of compassion and faith and hope that Jesus sees them. 
He goes on and he says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. He actually quotes the book of Hosea, this Old Testament prophet. And what he's saying to his disciples is this. This is not a religious obligation. I'm not looking for you to do this like the Pharisees do it. Because the Bible teaches us, you know who the greatest evangelists were? They were the Pharisees. Do you know how great of an evangelist they were? The Bible tells us they would walk cross the sea to win one convert. We barely will cross the street. But Jesus doesn't want us to be like the Pharisees. Because they may cross the sea to win a convert, but they don't have the compassion for that lost person. And they're simply looking to try to fix that person and bring them into the fold. And he says, no, no, it's not about an obligation. It's not about a burden. And this is really important to get into your heart at the very beginning. Because a lot of times when we think about reaching our neighbor, this kind of weight comes on us. Oh, no. I can't do that. There's fear. What if I do it wrong? There's confusion. And all these emotions come into play, and the enemy is part of that. And Jesus is teaching his disciples, and he's teaching us this really simple thing. You have to make an effort, but you will discover over the next few weeks, there's actually an ease to this. It actually isn't hard. It may stretch your faith a little bit, but right now if you're sitting here going, oh man, what am I going to do for the next seven Wednesday nights because I'm not coming back to this thing. <laughs> do not buy into the enemy's lie that this is hard. This is not hard. There's some effort, there's some faith, but there's an ease to it. Jesus goes on, he says, listen, you're called to the sinner. When he looks at the disciples, here's what he says. This is so important because it's part of who you are. It's not just something you do after you become a Christian. You don't even just do this as a means of obedience to Jesus. This is your calling. Your very identity is wrapped up in how you live out your faith as a witness to the world. You love others because that's who you are now as a new creation in Christ. And sometimes we get our roles mixed up. The Holy Spirit has a role over the next few weeks, and we have a role. Our role is to convince people of God's love. The Holy Spirit's role is to convict them of their sin. Never confuse the two roles. Because when we confuse the two roles, we find ourselves playing God. He says, no, no, all you do is convince them. This, you're called. This is your identity. Jesus has loved me so much this love now has to flow out of me. That's why I say there's a surprise waiting for you over the next few weeks. Because when you walk into your identity as a worshiper in here, you discover something of God. And when you walk into your identity as somebody who shares their faith, you discover something of God. And if that part of your walk with Christ hasn't been strong, I got to tell you, these next few weeks, you're going to discover more of God than you ever imagined because that's who you are. That's what you're called to. He ends it this way in this passage. He says, go and learn. If Jesus was here right now in the flesh, he would say the same thing. Go and learn. And when we were putting this series together, that's why we felt it was really important. It wasn't enough to just have a teaching series. There had to be a challenge to it. Go and learn by doing, and when you do, your personal growth will come into your life. So look at these next few weeks, June and July, with a sense of anticipation. God, what are you going to show me? A sense of, I'm going to be in a position I've never been in before, because I've always hesitated and been nervous and quiet about sharing my faith with my coworkers, now I'm gonna find myself being able to do that. What does that look like and what will I discover about the Holy Spirit in me? Jesus lays this foundation for the disciples and us saying, listen, this is what you're called to do and it's not hard, go and do it. And for the next seven, eight weeks, we're gonna do that. We're gonna follow what he told us to do. Then Paul, 
talked about it in his own way, which was the second scripture that really laid a foundation for us. Turn over in your Bibles now to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul talks about how he did reach, and it gives us an insight into how we're going to do reach. Paul wants to eliminate wrong ideas and wrong thoughts about what it means to live out your faith. My hope is during these next few weeks, a lot of your perhaps misconceptions or your fears will be dispelled as you discover what the Bible really teaches about how we do this. So here's what he wrote to the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19. He said, though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a servant to everyone to win as many as possible. We're going to discover that serving is God's key to living out his love with others because there's a power behind it. Then he says this in verse 20. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though lo, I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became like the weak to win the weak. Here's how he summates it. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. Amen. And we're going dis to discover this. Paul was incredibly intentional. He wasn't haphazard about this. He wasn't random about this. You're going to discover over the next weeks there's an intentionality that we're going to all follow together that God lays out for us. That actually helps us. Then he says this in verse 23, I do all of this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. And Paul gives us kind of three insights into how we go about reaching our neighbor with Christ's love. First, he said, I made myself a servant, verse 19. Reach is about serving. Why? Because the method by which we show Christ's love has to match the message and the message is about love and serving. So the method has to match that. Otherwise, it, it doesn't quite work very well. I was in a park, and there was a mom with two kids, and one kid was hitting the other kid. And here's what the mom did. She smacked the kid and said, stop hitting your brother. Stop hitting your brother. And I thought, that's not going to communicate very well. <laughs> You're hitting your child to tell them not to hit somebody. The method didn't match the message. Every parent has done this. Your kids start screaming, and what do you do? You join the screaming to tell them to stop screaming. <laughs> stop screaming, and you realize, I'm doing it myself. <laughs> and a lot of times, our method doesn't match the message of the gospel. And the message of the gospel is not just doctrinal truth or moral performance. The message of the gospel I came to serve, not to be served. It's love and service. So at the very beginning, we discover, how do we begin to see God lead us to our neighbors? Serving will be a really important part of it. You say, Joel, what does that look like? The Bible's really clear. We will do some very simple good works. Bayless talked about it this last weekend. If you weren't here, get the teaching. It was really good. Because what happens is you do a simple good work, and God uses that some act of kindness, and he breathes onto it, and all of a sudden now, it opens this door for a conversation that wouldn't have been there before. Our simple acts of service is what God will use. Years ago, when we lived in Chicago, I'm driving home, and there's this old guy with groceries, and he's walking along the sidewalk, and it dawns on me, he's probably walking home. So I pulled my car over, got out, went over to him, and I said, sir, do you mind if I help you walk your, you know, walk your groceries home? And he said, sure, that'd be great. I grabbed his groceries, and we walked about two blocks to his house. He went into his house. He let me in. I went in, too. I set the groceries down on the kitchen table, and he looked at me with this kind of bewildered look on my face. And he asked me what anybody would ask me. Why did you do that? When you do an act of kindness... Oftentimes, the person is the one who initiates the conversation to reveal the motivation and the love of God behind it. You don't have to barge into anybody. 
This is how this works through scripture. So service will be a very important part of it because we have this fear. I got to get people saved. Why would they do that to me? Why would the church force me to get people saved? <laughs> You're going to hear me say this over and over again. Count the conversations. Do not count the conversions. Count the conversations. Do not count the conversions because some till and some plant, and some water and some harvest. Reach is about you being positioned by God to have conversations that he anoints and he uses to whatever degree he wants in that pattern. What you're going to do is some acts of kindness that will create an opportunity for that kind of a normal conversation. This is what Paul said. This is what's most important. I am going to serve. I have made myself a servant to everyone to win as many as possible. So that's a key part of reach, and you'll see how in just a minute. Then he says in verse 20 through 22, I became like the Jews, I became like those who were weak. There's this high level of intentionality for Paul. Many of us in here have relationships with people who are not Christians. But if we're honest, it's like the relationship is stuck in an orbit. And it's been stuck in that orbit for a year or two years. They even know we're Christians, but we need something to break it out of that orbit. And what we're going to discover and reach over the next weeks is there's this intentionality where there's a process that will help that relationship get to another place. Because one of the fears that we have is, well, I'm not qualified to do this. I don't know what to say. I don't know the Bible well enough. What the Bible teaches us is you're not called to be a theologian. You're not even called to be an evangelist. You're called to tell your story. That's all you're called to do, is to tell your story of what Jesus means to me. So one of the Wednesday nights, we're actually going to have a teaching from Scripture as to how you tell your story. Because when you tell your story out there, you don't get all this stuff. You don't get mood music in the background. <laughs> I was talking to somebody a few months ago, and we we're having this conversation about Christ, and I'm going, I need Paco on the keys. I can't do this. <laughs> you don't get the smoke. You don't get the crowd of thousands of people behind you in prayer. No, you get like 90 seconds. And there's all kinds of noise around you. We're going to teach you, how do I tell my story in 90 seconds and see God use it in an authentic and amazing way? This is what Paul did. There was a high degree of intentionality. You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to be an expert. Some of you have heard me say this, and it's very true in reach. People will not remember much of what you said, but they will always remember how they felt when they were around you. That's the heart of Christ towards lost people. It's the heart that we will carry in enormous ways. Then Paul said, I do this for the sake of the gospel. Paul says, listen, there's a greater story going on here. God's in charge of this. The gospel is his power. And one of the key elements of reach that makes it kind of like, I can take a breath and relax, is you'll discover through this process, every step of the way, you are not creating, you are following. You're going to follow God's lead, and we're going to show you how that happens, where every step of the way, God sets you up, and you know, okay, this is next, and you're going to be following his lead. There's a grace. You don't have to make it happen. You can relax. You can breathe. If you miss a week, it's not the end of the world. So don't carry a burden that the enemy would want to put on you. God's in charge of this. And he's going to give you God moments. There was a couple that were in a neighborhood as believers, and they decided that they were going to try to reach their neighbors, and they weren't quite sure how to do that. And the lady had a quick conversation with their neighbors, her, the woman, and the other couple who were not Christian, they're in their living room. And here's the conversation that went on in the living room of the unsaved people. And the lady said, oh, I met the lady across the street. And the husband said, oh, are they Christian? Are they like religious people? And she said, yeah, I think they're pretty religious. And the husband said, oh, I don't want anything to do with them. Then. I, don't, you know, I just don't want religious people in my life right now. And the lady said, well, she seems pretty nice. And the husband said, no. And they kind of went back and forth. And finally, the husband said this, I tell you what, if she brings over an apple pie, I'll build a friendship with her. Now, while this conversation is happening, true story, in the other house, the other couple are having a conversation. Oh, we should try to reach out to them. What can we do? They didn't fast and pray, God, tell me what fruit pie to make. <laughs> she said, I'm going to make them a pie. 
very naturally, she said, I'm going to make him an apple pie. And that night, she took an apple pie over. She was as astounded as the people across the street were. She was like blown away. Wow, God was working in me to bake an apple pie, and I didn't even know it. That's what you're going to discover. Now, some of you may not have that dramatic of a story. Don't go home and go, oh, which pie should I make? <laughs> Some of your stories are going to be really natural. Just because they're not that dramatic doesn't mean God isn't just as much in them. God will be through it. Paul says, I do this for the sake of the gospel. I'm not in charge of this thing. God is fully and completely in charge of this thing, not me. That's what reaches. So when you came in, you got one of these. If you didn't get one of these, hold your hand up and the ushers will make sure that you get one because we want to make sure everybody has one in their hand. So if the ushers could go ahead and pass those out, that would be great. I am going to take just a few minutes and explain to you while they're handing these out what REACH is and what this challenge looks like. So on Wednesday nights in June and July, we're worshiping God, we're being taught the word from our pastors, and then we're going to have this challenge during the week. Guys, go ahead and show that slide that shows the REACH acronym. Here's the five steps of REACH that we're going to do over the next seven or eight weeks. The first step is ready your life. That's this week. In just a few minutes, I'm going to give you a few minutes, and if you look on like the third or fourth page, there's a place, and you're going to write down ten names of people. Don't do it now, because I've got some instructions for you so you don't become religious on me as to how you write those ten names down. And you're going to pray for those ten people for a week. Can everybody pray for five minutes each day for a week? That's doable, isn't it? That's not hard. No, no real threat. You can do that, right? All you're going to do this week leading up to next Wednesday is you're going to pray for these 10 people for five minutes each day. That's all. You'll be, you'll be good. Then we move from there into engage through kindness. Here's what takes place. Now, follow me, but you don't have to memorize this because we'll remind you of it. Next Wednesday, those 10 names, here's what you're going to do. You're going to say, God, which five names did you impress on my heart? And you're going to take the 10... And next Wednesday, you're going to narrow it to five. Now, you're not going to do that logically. You're not going to do that rationally. The Holy Spirit's going to guide you. It's not going to be crazy. You're not going to be writing on the walls. You're just going to say, these five seem to be it. And we're going to take ten names that we started with, and we're going to go through five. Then we go to engage through kindness. For the next two weeks... You're going to take those five people, and over a two-week period, you're going to do some small act of kindness. While the teachers are up here teaching from the Word, they're going to give you lots of ideas. And you're going to do what act of kindness? God, what could I do for them? It could be as simple as collect their mail and bring it to them, mow their lawn, do some extra task at work if that's one of the people. God will give you ideas. You'll come up with ideas. And it's not both rocket science and you don't need like Holy Spirit revelation because whatever idea you do, it's God who uses it. So that's engaged through kindness. So you'll have two weeks to do a simple act of kindness. How many of you have done a simple act of kindness? Yeah, everybody, right? That's not too tough, is it? You can do a simple act of kindness. So you're going to do a simple act of kindness. Then two weeks after we're done with that, we move to advance to relationship. And for two weeks, then what happens is those five people you did an act of kindness to, you're going to answer this question. Which two seem to be most responsive to my act of kindness? One of the five may have gone, that was really weird, lady. I don't know why you did that, but that was really weird. But I guarantee you, a couple of them will engage with you. They will thank you. And you'll know something's on this. God's on this. You're following his leading. You're not creating it. You're following it. So when we go to advanced relationship, you actually take the five and you bring it down to two. Who are the two over the next two weeks that I'm not just going to bake a pie for, but I'm going to say, hey, you want to go get dinner together? You want to go have a coffee together? And we're going to learn how we do that and how we tell our story. Now, we tell our story after... We've prayed after we've done acts of kindness, after we've seen that God's hand is on this somewhere. Then telling the story becomes a lot easier to do that. When we're done with that, then we move to C, which is you don't ever have to do this alone. 
And so we have a stage where you can now connect them to church. That means you can invite them to church. It means you may introduce them to other friends of yours who are Christians so that you don't have to carry all of this alone. When I was engaging with a neighbor and he was really into surfing and I don't surf and I got to see, first thing I did was inter introduce him to a couple of Christian friends of mine who were surfers because I didn't have to carry this relationship all the way to the end. I could involve the body of Christ, the community. So we're going to learn about what the Bible teaches about how we don't have to do this alone. We actually get to do this together. And truthfully, the other wrinkle we're going to add on Wednesday nights is at the end of the teaching, we're going to take just a few minutes in small groups, pray for each other. Because if you have to do this alone, it gets scary. And it gets kind of lonely. But if you know every Wednesday night, hey, there's this small group of people. And for a few minutes after worship and after the teaching of the word, we're going to get together and pray. And that's really going to help me and inspire me. Together, we will do this. Connect to church. And then the last Wednesday night of July is really a special Wednesday night because what the Bible teaches is we have to give these people to the Lord. You're not called to carry the burden of their lives. You have to hand them over to Christ with faith and with hope. So that's just a nutshell of what this looks like. On Wednesdays, there's worship. On Wednesdays, there's teaching. On Wednesdays, there's a lot of ideas. But there is a challenge. You're not just going to leave here with a sense of, hey, that was a great teaching. We're really hoping that all of us, the staff, the pastors, all of us, will go, okay, this week, stage one, i got to pray for 10 people. I only need to pray for five minutes. But i got to pray for these 10 people, and that'll get me to stage two next Wednesday night. So let's do stage one, ready your life, identifying 10 neighbors that you have to pray for this week. Here's your instructions. If you look at the pa fourth page, you'll see these blanks. Now, before you write any names down, listen to me carefully. Do not put any filters when you write these names down. Your temptation will be to do this. Oh, Bob, no, no, Bob would never say yes to Jesus. And you are automatically playing God. You're automatically determining. Mary, oh, Mary's still mad at me for one. I didn't give her a ride to work. No. John, John lives in New York. I can't do that in New York. Do not have any filters. Ten names that come into your mind right now. Family members, coworkers, neighbors, just write their names down. Whatever they are, I'm just going to give you a minute or two. Just write their name down. There is no wrong answer. This is not a test. There's no revelation from heaven. It's just 10 names of 10 people who you know aren't saved or are in a backslidden position or just don't have a vibrant relationship with Jesus whatsoever. Just write those 10 names down. If you can't get all 10 tonight, don't worry about it. You can do it tomorrow. It's not legalism here. But don't have filters. If a name pops into your mind, write it down. Do not exclude it because they're Buddhist right now. Doesn't matter. All right, as you write those down, let me give you a thought about how you're going to pray for these 10 names five minutes a day. First of all, all you're going to do is pray. Do not write down the name Bob, see Bob on Wednesday, and go up to Bob and say, Hey, Bob, God gave me your name. You're going to become a Christian. Let me give you the four spiritual laws. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do anything. Just pray. Five minutes a day for 10 names. Just pray, and we'll let God do what God's going to do so you don't have to worry about anything else. Be patient. God will lead us. James 4, 2 says this. You have not because you ask not. Can I give you one biblical tip as to how to pray for these 10 names? Pray with gratitude. When you pray for them, and they don't have to be long prayers, Five minutes for ten names is about 30 seconds a name. Pray gratitude. Lord, thank you for Bob. Thank you for his life. Thank you that you died for him. Thank you for his family. Thank you for who he's going to become. Thank you for how he's a positive influence in our neighborhood. Pray gratitude prayers. Why? Because gratitude prayers reposition you. When you pray prayers of gratitude, you're the one who is changed. And you will see Bob and Juan, and Mary, and Sue, and John, with different eyes. 
So pray these prayers of gratitude for this next seven-day window. And that's all you have to do for these ten names. And when we come back next Wednesday, then we will move into stage two, which is who are the five out of the ten through this week of prayer is that the Holy Spirit has kind of raised into my heart and soul are the five that I should do an act of kindness with, and you'll have two weeks to do that. You with me? Does this make sense? All right, so Jesus and what he said to the disciples, reach is about a heart of compassion. Love people. Don't fix them. Just love them. Be authentic in who you are. Paul, in what he said, serve. Be intentional. And let God do his work. And I pray that you will commit yourself to this process because if you do, wow, there is something that God has for you Two weeks from now, four weeks from now, next week, something he has for you that I can't predict, but I can tell you for sure because you'll reposition yourself out there. Now, the last wrinkle we have on our Wednesday nights for June and July, we don't normally do this, but we thought it would be really important because of the activity involved, is we're going to take a few minutes at the end of every teaching, and we're just going to gather in groups of like five or six. If you're watching on live stream and you're watching with one or two people, do what we're going to do. If you're watching alone, then Make God part of your group and pray together. Here's what we're going to do. Each Wednesday night, we're going to take just a few minutes and have a short, short conversation. And then we're going to take a few minutes and we're going to pray. Because Jesus never sent anybody alone. And we don't want anybody to feel alone. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to stand your feet with me. All right? Stand to your feet. And I'm going to ask you to just get with five or six people, and you're going to do two things. Take a few minutes. If you don't want to talk, you don't have to. No pressure. But take a few minutes and talk about the fear that you've had, some of the experiences you've had in reaching your neighbor. If you give language to it, it comes from darkness to light, God heals it. And then pray for each other for a few minutes as you begin to embark on reach. So we're going to actually put a clock on the screens. Grab four or five people around you, share your experience, pray for each other, and then all bring us back together. Let's begin reach. Hey there. Um, I just want to just take this time right now just to encourage you that it might be really easy just to kind of tune out or, you know, hang out during this time or even check out. But you know what? Like Pastor Joel said, we um, encourage you to engage with maybe the people that you're around right now or even just yourself and God. Take these next six minutes to just... Um, pray and think about, like he said, maybe those write down those 10 people that even though you might not have the journal right now, just create your own reach journal. Write down 10 names of people that are in your world that you know you need to reach out to and um, just take some time to pray for them. Uh, and these next few weeks are going to be really, really good. We encourage you to come back every single week. And like I said, create your own reach journal or if you're local, come and get one next time you're here. But um, I just want to take a minute right now just to pray with you and for the people that you're with. And so Heavenly Father, God, we just come before you and we just thank you, Father, for what you're doing through this REACH program, God. We just thank you, Father, for everybody that is tuning in right now, Lord Jesus, for the people that you have on their hearts, God, for the, the, the neighbor, Lord Jesus, that they're nervous to talk to, or the coworker, God, or the person at the grocery store, or their male lady or man. I just pray right now, God, that you are stirring something new in them, Lord Jesus, stirring a, a, a courage, God, and an excitement, Father, to reach people for your name, God, to, to just love on people to do acts of kindness, God. And I just thank you, Father, that you are just um, impressing those people right now on each person right now, God, that they are writing them down even as I speak, God, that you are bringing those faces to light, Lord. And even if you don't know the name, I just thank you, Father, that you, or that we don't know the name, that you know the name, God. So I just thank you, Father, for each person, Lord Jesus, that's going to be re reached out to during this process, Father. And for 
courage and for just um, strength, Lord Jesus. We just thank you for each um, person that's going to be doing this, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. And so again, I just really encourage you that, you know what, if you don't know their name, write down mailman, write down grocery store person, write down whoever, because you know what, at some point you are going to get to know them and you're going to have that opportunity to do that act of kindness, to open up that conversation. I love what Pastor Joel said about uh, counting the the conversations and not the conversions. And so, um, I, we still have another four minutes. So take these next four minutes, like I said, just to write down those names, pray for them. And then Pastor Joel is going to be back up in just a few minutes uh, to uh, wrap this up. And uh, I'll be back again at the end. If you want to hang out with me still, I would love to connect with you. So I'll see you guys in just about three minutes and 43 seconds. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful. Lord, we are so incredibly grateful. We worship you and we thank you. We praise you, Lord Jesus. We worship you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for your goodness in our life, Lord Jesus. Lord, we are so grateful 
that you saw in us life, that you came and you died and you resurrected for us. Lord, we thank you that you trust us with your good news, that you send us out. And Lord, as we embark on this kind of two-month challenge of reach to know your word and to follow your word, right now, Lord, we lift up every name that is written down in these hundreds and hundreds of journals, all the names that are represented, Lord God, that over the next weeks will discover your love and your goodness. We pray even now, Lord, that you would prepare them as you prepare us. Would you ready our heart as we pray prayers of gratitude? Would you give us your eyes to see our neighbors with? May there be a, an overflow of compassion that we know does not come from our own self but truly comes out of the depths of heaven through us, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, for sending us, for the privilege of representing you and your love of telling our story to others. May this week be a glorious week of prayer as we prepare ourselves for this REACH campaign. We love you and you thank you. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Listen, I got to tell you a story. We're going to take the offering, but I got to tell you a story. I was uh, trying to talk to my neighbor about Christ, and I did an act of kindness to him and all this kind of stuff. And then one day he was across the street in his yard. So I thought, okay, I'm going to go over and talk to him. This is now my time because he's outside and I've done my act of kindness. And I walked over to him and I was a little nervous that I would say it wrong, that I'd get it all wrong, you know, my tongue tied. And I, I thought for sure I'm going to say, you know, if you believe in Jesus, you will spend eternity in hell. Something would be, it'd just be all mixed up. And sure enough, I got over there and he was kind of kneeling down and I, I said, hey, can I talk to you? And he said, sure. And I just went blank. What do I say now? What's like my opening line? And I didn't, you know, and I, and I got all, like my mouth got dry. You ever had that when your mouth just gets really dry? Your palms get really sweaty. I love what Joyce Meyer said. She said, just lick your palms and get on with it. You know, go on. <laughs> but it was me. I was like, I don't know. And everything I was afraid would happen, happened. I misquoted scripture. I am sure I said, if you believe in Jesus, you'll burn in hell. I'm sure I said that. <laughs> And it was the most awkward three-minute conversation I've ever had. And I walked back across the street into my house, and I just went, oh, everything I was afraid of actually took place. What a fool I am. And like five minutes later, there's a knock on my door. And it's him. And he comes over, and he knocks on the door. And I said, I'm so surprised. I said, yeah. He said, Joel, he said, you know, I didn't quite get what you were saying to me. <laughs> I said, yeah, I know, I didn't get it either. He said, but I'm watching the game. You want to come over and watch it with me? You have no idea how God will use you. Hopefully, a few weeks from now, you'll do a little bit better job than I did. But God will use you. And when he does, in that moment, when he said, you want to come over, every fear I had seemed so foolish, even though it had come to pass. I thought, God, you're in charge of this thing. I'm just along for the ride. We went over, we watched the game, we talked about my faith, we talked about my church. Have fun over the next seven weeks and enjoy the ride with God. Amen?